Hello, uh, this is Carlos Cañas. I'm going to be doing some uh, expanding on some of the ideas that uh, Father Lampert uh, shares with uh, Raymond Arroyo on a EWTN news story on the rise of exorcisms. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. He's one of 50 priests in the U.S. trained for a very special ministry. And the demand for his services is growing at an alarming rate. By his own account, he receives 20 calls a week from people desperate for help. Father Vincent Lampert is a Vatican-trained exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. He's traveled all over the world talking about his experiences doing battle with evil. I sat down with him here in Washington, D.C. recently to discuss his ministry and why he believes demonic activity is on the rise. Take a look. Father, we seem to be seeing an explosion in demand for, pardon the crude term, your services uh, as an exorcist. Why do you think we're seeing this increase in both attention as well as perhaps authentic possession now rather than years before. People oftentimes ask me, is there a greater sense of evil in the, in the world today? Mm -hmm. My response always is I think that, I don't know that the devil has upped his game, but I think more people today are willing to play the devil's game. Mm. You know, faith in God will lead us in one direction, the lack of faith will lead us in another, and certainly faith is on decline in the lives of many people. What, what are some of the portal Number one here, uh, as you just heard the father say, in today's world, we have a lot of uh, the younger uh, generations that are not going to church and have stopped believing in God. And so that opens up the possibility for demonic possession. And as you will find out as we go further into the video, there are different levels of possession or uh, uh, disturbances that can occur and so here we'll continue with that right there or doorways i mean demonic possession more often than not doesn't just come upon ambushes as we're walking home in the evening there there are ways that the devil enters in yes yes there are and what would those be as an exorcist that would be the main thing i would look for what's the entry point huh. such as ties to the occult Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody has been cursed. Somebody has been dedicated to a demon. Mm -hmm. One has a new. Let's see. Ties to the occult. What was it else? The other thing, Jean Luc? Um, they have been dedicated. Dedicated to, to a demon from uh, birth and uh, also yeah cursing a uh, person can be cursed so these are three of uh, the things that uh, the priest talks about and in looking at some some of the uh, other videos that I've been watching uh they also concur with that same uh, idea that uh, a lot of the young people and even older people are getting into the occult. On one of our recent trips to um, San Antonio, uh, one of the malls, several of the uh, vendors there were actual witches and sold a lot of different things that have to do with witchcraft. So it's becoming more mainstream, and as it becomes more mainstream and starts to take over uh, traditional uh, Christian religions, uh, then you see us going backwards, almost like to the times before uh, God was uh, made known to man, uh, before the Jews, and when it was just uh, different gods and different uh, ways of believing. I did a demon in, uh, broken relationships, a life of habitual sin. These are probably inviting, 
a demon. And uh, number five, habitual life of sin. Which is very easy to do. And to, well, it's always been easy to do. Uh, if you don't go to church, if you don't pray, then you may ha be habitually living a life of sin. Uh, whether it be uh, uh, gambling, alcoholism, uh, pornography, uh, infidelity, any of those things that can come across uh, stealing, uh, being dishonest, all of those things can lead, of course, to closer ties with the demons with Satan. Primarily the ways I think that people can invite evil in. Wow. And, and do, you, do you think there's something special, and I guess you get this a lot, that sets you apart? Why were you chosen, do you think, to be the exorcist in your diocese? I jokingly always say I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> so I was appointed 11 years ago, and my bishop at the time said that he was looking for a priest who believed in the reality of evil, but not one who was going to be gullible to believe that everyone who came to him was actually up against the forces of evil. And how do you train? How does one train for something like this? I mean, you went to Rome. You worked. Uh, I know you took that course. There's, a, there's the course on exorcism. Uh -huh. But you actually got involved with this before that course was available. Yeah, when my bishop appointed me, he knew I was going on sabbatical uh -huh. in the early part of 2006 in Rome. And so he told me while I was there that I should also study this. And I was able to connect with a uh, priest over there who allowed me to uh, train under him. So during the three months I lived in Rome, I was able to participate in 40 exorcisms that he performed. Wow. And you still took the job. <laughs> the life of obedience as a priest. <laughs> I'll say. Were you, were you at all frightened by being party to this? I mean, you're, you're seeing this phenomena. Oftentimes, the, the guttural voices, there are things at times that can levitate their cold spots. I mean, I've spoken to many of your conferences who tell, speak of this sort of phenomena. Did you experience any of that, and did it cause you to hesitate at all? That hesitation would be a better word than fear, because, mm -hmm. I mean, I saw a lot of the traditional things that people describe, eyes rolling back in one's head, foaming at the mouth, growling, snarling, even saw someone levitate during an exorcism. But I came to learn early on that these are all tricks of the devil trying to uh, disrupt the prayer of the church. Huh. You've said that an exorcist is trained to be a skeptic. Yes. A lot of people might hear that and go, oh, wait a minute, what, what's he talking about? Why is it important to be a skeptic? Because the church wants to make sure that all other possible avenues of what's going on in the person have been addressed because it would do greater harm if the church labeled somebody as possessed, if that label would prevent the person from getting the true help that they need. Mm. And how do you evaluate people? They come to the door, they call you, and they say, Father, I'm possessed, or my daughter's possessed, or we think there's a possession here. What happens? What would you do as a first order? By the time somebody contacts me, there's a protocol that's followed, at least here in the United States, having somebody get a psychiatric evaluation, Mm -hmm. having one get a physical examination, and then I would do a complete history of the person, trying to figure out if evil truly is present, what was the entry point, mm -hmm. and then trying to resume the person's spiritual life, because it isn't just about praying for someone and casting out evil, it's about helping the person to really establish an authentic relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. Tell me... So, uh, right here, the uh, Father Lampert is... is uh, is letting us know that just because somebody thinks that they are possessed does not mean that necessarily mean that they are. And so the church has a procedure and all medical avenues are looked at before they actually say, yes, the person is possessed. And so you can see that uh, science and religion or faith is being uh, mixed together there. And uh, you can see that there are sometimes supernatural occurrences that human science cannot explain. About the levels 
of possession. They're gradations of demonic influence. It's not all full-on possession where people are, you know, climbing up the sides of the walls. You encounter, I mean, you've come across things that are of a lesser variety, but no less distressing and concerning to those involved. Yeah, well, there's like different types of extraordinary demonic activity, demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. Mm. Demonic vexation would be physical attacks that one is experiencing, and then demonic obsession, which would be mental attacks, and then the other one, as you mentioned, demonic possession itself. Mm. Now, in infestation, what does that mean? Describe that. Have you come across that in your work? I get lots of calls about just so you can see the four levels that he's talking about. Infestation, vexation, obsession, and possession. The actual, the one that most of the movies that you see are, are talking about possession. Uh, some, of, some of the movies like um, Amityville Horror, you might see infestation. Some of the things are, seem to be possessed, items in the room or things like that people who think strange things are happening in their house uh, or maybe an object that's been cursed mm. so uh it would really if something's been cursed it's been dedicated to a demon mm. if something is blessed it's commended to god so the role of the exorcist in that case would be to go so something an item a person can be uh dedicated or blessed uh to either evil or to good, to God. And so that's something that we need to realize. Uh, one of the reasons that you should not go to curanderas is because of uh, the fact that they deal in uh, spells and magic and uh, the, all of those are ways to open the door to demonic possession and demonic influence. When to offer a prayer of blessing and breaking that connection with evil. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's as simple as doing a blessing, a deliverance prayer. What's the difference? Tell people about that, because I think some, even priests, they hear exorcism and they all kind of start pushing away from the table and looking for the exits. Um, Another thing he's talking about here is blessings, and what was the other word that he said? Uh, okay, well, blessings... Uh, you can look on YouTube and find, or on just the regular internet, you can find different kinds of blessings for your home. It's very important that your home, your car, uh, your children, your grandchildren, that you have, you, you bless them, that you dedicate them to God uh, so that that gives you some protection especially if somebody's working outside of your family, trying to influence your family in some kind of uh, demonic or negative way. It, let's face it, it frightens some people. It's seen as something kind of otherworldly that I don't want to get too close to. I told you the story earlier, my daughter, when I, and I said, you know, who are you interviewing tomorrow, Dad? I said, well, I'm an author, and I'm going to interview a, a Father Vincent, who's an exorcist. And she looked at me and said, well, I would recommend you don't shake his hand. <laughs> I said, oh, great. So, from the mouths of babes, but I think she was wrong. Um, give me a sense of when you hear that um, a house is possessed or that, that uh, or a house is, is uh, infested, how do you determine that it's infested or not? Well, you determine if something has actually taken place in that house of an evil nature. St. Thomas Aquinas would say that evil is, is neither here nor there. We say it's there mm -hmm. if it's choosing to act there. So if evil is present in a house with somebody ties to the occult, with some heinous crime committed there, mm -hmm. so trying to determine what brought about that presence of evil. Mm -hmm. And a priest can go in and say a blessing, offer a prayer of deliverance, without being a um, designated exorcist in a diocese. Absolutely, because of those different types of extraordinary demonic activity, any priest can deal with infestation, vexation, and obsession. Really, only cases of demonic possession should the exorcist be called upon. And really, the... So here you're hearing from the priest uh, that your priest at your church should be able to help you in, in cases of infestation, vexation, and obsession. Uh, all of the priests that are ordained priests 
should have the knowledge and the background to be able to help in those situations. It's only when there's actual possession that you would need an actual exorcist. The notion is that if a priest takes his priesthood seriously, mm -hmm. so will the devil. Mm. When you are called in on a case, do you have a team around you? I know some exorcists I've interviewed in the past, they have a medical team, a couple of doctors they consult with. They also have a group of what I would consider sort of prayer backup, prayer warriors who attend the exorcism. Well, how do you proceed? I kind of look at it differently. In speaking with my bishop over the years, I've always thought the presbyterate of the diocese really is the prayer team. Mm. It really is engaging all the priests of the diocese to think about their own vocation, their own calling to priesthood and what that means. Mm. And certainly a common theme about being a priest is dealing with the forces of evil and helping people to establish a right relationship with God. Should you try to recruit fellow priests to come to the exorcism when you're performing the rite, when you're... Yes, I have, I have absolutely done that and asked them to be there to, to pray. And tell me about that rite. Tell me about that exorcism rite. Some people may be unfamiliar with it. Do you perform it in Latin? And why is it so special and reserved for a designated exorcist? The ritual of exorcism that came out in 1999 was the last liturgical rite to be updated after the Second Vatican Council. Mm -hmm. It was tweaked again in 2004 and it basically replaced the one that had been in existence since 1614. Mm -hmm. But one of the big differences in the new rite, it included supplicating prayers, which are prayers directed to God, which anyone can pray. So the rite really is a liturgical prayer of the church, really asking. So you would be looking for a prayer of supplication if you're working or trying to uh, pray against infestation, vexation, or obsession. Uh, that would be for a lay person or, I guess, even uh, well, the priests for sure. God to intervene in the life of one who is being afflicted by evil and asking God to give that person the sense of peace once again. Hmm. Do you prefer the Latin? Some exorcists I've spoken to say the devil hates Latin, so that's all I use. I don't get caught up in that because I know Latin is the language of the church, but it's what even more important to me is the holiness of the person. The intention of the one performing to me, the right. Because ultimately the exorcist is trying to take one who's within the realm of darkness and bring them into the light of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of uh, Moses in the Old Testament. When he went to Pharaoh and said, God says to let my people go, what happens to the staff of Moses' hand? It turns into a serpent. Mm -hmm. But Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the same thing. But what's the difference between Moses and them? Moses is a man of God. So to me, in an exorcism, what I really believe is important is for the exorcist to be a man of God. Mm. You've said that pagan practices can invite evil in and can lead to these various uh, levels of demonic involvement. What does that mean, pagan practices? It ties to the occult. You know, the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus, meaning hidden or secret. Mm -hmm. and a lot of those practices... So pagan uh, rituals or pagan practices, practices, uh, and occult means hidden are condemned in uh, the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament mm -hmm. because they're a violation of the first commandment because when people turn to these practices they're turning away from God and actually putting something else in the place of God well, when you first sit down with someone you do what it's not everybody that comes to you is possessed I mean they may be showing signs of things how do you discern I sit down and want to talk to them, and I ask them why they, be they believe they're up against the forces of evil. So again, I try to look for that entry point. Mm -hmm. You know, the church says that there's, there are criteria if one is possessed, such as speaking languages un otherwise unknown to the individual, mm -hmm. strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual, elevated perception, knowledge about things that they shouldn't otherwise know, and then an aversion to things of a sacred nature. So an exorcist may have a few tricks up his sleeve, if you want to use that word. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have water, maybe it's holy water, maybe it's tap water. Mm -hmm. I know that, the person doesn't,
but the presence of evil will know whether or not this item, if you will, has been blessed. Mm -hmm. So that's that, those become tests that you can administer to see if you get a yeah. reaction or not. If you, yeah, if you bless them with tap water and they start reacting violently, mm -hmm. then maybe it's really something of a psychological nature. Now, a lot of people who've only seen exorcisms, and which would probably be the majority of <laughs> us, uh, on television or on a film or on stage, uh, th these can happen anywhere, usually in the room of the afflicted or in a house or something. That's usually not where these exorcisms take place. Where do you usually conduct an exorcism? Well, the devil doesn't get to decide where he will be defeated. So an exorcism always takes place in a sacred space. I always tell people that an exorcism is never going to take place in an abandoned house on a dead-end street at midnight during an electrical storm. The devil doesn't get to decide. Don't tell Bill Blatty now. <laughs> You'll get very upset. I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. But the devil doesn't get to decide where he will be defeated. Uh, and, and what about, you said you invite other clergymen in. How many? It depends. Obviously... I will determine the location, and I will be there, the person afflicted, a family member or two, and then maybe a couple other priests to be present, just to be in prayer. Mm. And part of the right is to get the demon to reveal his identity, to speak the name that is infesting and possessing this person. Why is that a focal point? What does that achieve? Because knowing the name, when somebody gives your name, you have a certain power of control over them. So when a demon names itself, it's demonstrating that it's finally submitting to the power and the authority of Christ. Oh. And it takes many, many, it can take repeated exorcisms for this to happen. Because it depends on the, the strength of the evil that's present. Oh. My experience is that demons of a weaker nature, when prayers are prayed, they leave immediately. If ones are of a more dominant nature, they're more persistent. I will say, too, there's a difference between exorcisms performed in the pagan world and in the apostate world. So parts of the world where the good news of Christ has never been proclaimed and one's afflicted, mm -hmm. the exorcisms are immediate and effective. But in the apostate world where people have heard the good news, but now they've turned a deaf ear to it, it does seem that evil makes a greater claim on these people. Mm. And is it, is it one entity possessing them, or can it be multiple now, of course, the question is, why would it be that in, uh, in societies that do <clears throat> have uh, religion or, or Catholicism or, or, or Christianity, why is it that uh, getting rid of the demons is so much harder? And uh, one of the things that I heard on another uh, broadcast was that... Uh, when, when you are living in a society that has faith and you've been part of that faith community, but you have actually rejected, you're rejecting God and you're embracing the devil uh, or evil, uh, then of course that's going to be harder. Now the, those uh, innocent... Um, civilizations where there hasn't been any Christianity brought to those people, uh, of course, there they haven't had a choice. They haven't had that free will to choose God or to reject God. And so that's why um, uh, another priest had said that that is why it's so much harder in, in the civilized world or the Christian world. It's usually not a question of one, but of, of multiple. And not that there's a sense of fraternity or collaboration amongst the demons, but it does seem that they, they act in clusters. Now, I came across an interview with you, and you said not only is it a demon possessing a person, but souls of the dead can affix or attach to someone? Explain that. That's, a, that's really something that's being debated now. Mm -hmm. Do the souls of the damned kind of wander the earth awaiting the final judgment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that there's a definitive answer to that, but it's certainly a question that has been brought up within the uh, International Association of Exorcists mm -hmm. just I, as a way to debate those types of things. Have you had any experience with that sort of manifestation? I have not. I've no. never encountered that at all. And, and how do the possessed people manifest? And do you see a difference 
pardon the, the, the term, from demon to demon? Do you, is, there a, is there a difference? Or is it primarily the same sort of presenting phenomena? I think it's pretty much the same. It's usually something of kind of an animalistic nature. Mm -hmm. If you think about the story of creation, on the sixth day of creation, God created animals and he created humans. But what separates us from animals? That we can choose to honor and glorify God. So since the demons have rejected God, a lot of their manifestations are animalistic. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me for a moment about, uh, we've been seeing a lot of cult-like activity. Uh, I talked to friends of mine in law enforcement and they've been finding dead animals all over the place, beheaded animals. Um, do you see this as a rise in the occult, in um, whether it's animal sacrifice or some kind of santeria or this uh, Santa Muerte, this movement in Mexico? What are we seeing here? And uh, just to add to what Raymond is saying, um, actually, I just heard a, a, a podcast or broadcast on um, a priest was talking about the the drugs that are being brought in from uh, Mexico and Central America and South America, uh, many of the gang members that are in these uh, in these gangs and sending over the the uh, the drugs, they they are dedicated to Satan, and so the drugs that are being sent to the United States and throughout the world, in a sense, are already cursed with demonic possession or demonic infestation and so that of course if you look all you have to do is look at the news on a daily basis uh, and you will hear horror story after horror story of how people are killing their children uh, torturing their children uh, killing their wives wives killing their their children and uh, all kinds of horrible uh, demonic things that are going on. And a lot of this is happening with the drugs that, that are coming in and, and a lot of our young people and even older people, uh, middle-aged people, using, getting hooked on these drugs. Uh, and like I said, there's a, a lot of these, these drugs have, if not all of them, have been demonically tainted and so you're dabbling in the occult without even thinking or knowing that you are in the united states i think what we're seeing is that because faith is in decline in the lives of so many people even millennials i think i read recently that 70 percent of millennials no longer profess any religious affiliation whatsoever mm -hmm. so as belief in god is deteriorating there seems to be a growing fascination with these occult practices mm -hmm. it I think that's very important to look at. 70% of millennials, the younger, the, the younger generation that we have growing up right now, they have no affiliation with, with uh, Christ. They don't believe in him. They don't have a relationship with him. And so... Going and uh, having more of a being, a, how can you say? Um, a lot of these young people see Hollywood and all of the demonic stuff that comes out, the uh, different kinds of uh, demonic possessions and, and the Ouija board and and uh, Santeria, and uh, going to uh, Fortune Teller, uh, the horoscopes, you know, all these different things, the, the little spells that you can make, that you can do to make uh, your life better. Uh, and so they see all of this, and they say, well, this seems much more uh, the way that I want to do things. I can get instant answers, and I can get what I want when I want it. And in the Christian way of thinking, we give our lives to Jesus Christ and we put our life in his hands and we say, do with our life what you will. Your will be done, not mine. And so you see a total difference 
of way of thinking. These people that don't want to be, be Christians or do not want to believe in God, their idea is, I want to be God. I want to be in control, total control of what happens in my life. I don't want to have to give my life to God, and I don't have, want to have to believe in Him because I don't see Him, I don't feel Him, I don't know Him. And so this is very important for us to look at and think about. You think it's filling that void. It is, because I think a human person has that innate desire for something more. Of course, I would agree with Augustine that, you know, our hearts are restless, O oh Lord, until they rest in you. But when people have rejected God, they're trying to fill that in with something else. Yeah. Uh, tell me for a moment, uh, Father Gabriel Moore, the, at the time, Rome's chief exorcist, now deceased, he said, ISIS is Satan. He was talking about Islamic State and the way they're manifesting throughout the Middle East, and that this is a manifestation of satanic activity. Would you agree with that? Well, one would have to say, what is Satan all about? He's about division and hatred and violence. Mm -hmm. So to that degree, the answer would be yes, because as Christians, we believe that Christ came to create community. He gave us the church. Mm -hmm. But you look at groups like that, and they're all about violence again and hatred and tearing things apart. And death. Yeah, chaos. And chaos, which is another mark of the devil. Yes. What is the most misunderstood facet of what you do? And the thing you think people should understand about this ministry, which is what it is. Exorcism basically is, is a prayer of the church. It's praying with somebody who's afflicted. Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes people want to get caught up in all the theatrics of exorcism. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I tell people that if you think that you're up against the forces of evil, all you need to do is pray. As a Catholic, go to Mass, receive the sacraments, and the devil's already on the run. Mm -hmm. But people kind of look at that and they're like, huh? They really are looking for me to tell them to do something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But it's very, it's very much the ordinary components of our Christian faith that keep the devil at bay. Mm -hmm. And often the lack of them that present an opening. Exactly. Now, do you, uh, final question, when you see children afflicted, and I don't know how many you may have come across in your work or not. I don't know how high an incidence or low it might be. We don't have any data on that sort of thing. How do you explain that to people when you have a child who, you know, it's not like they were looking to get into trouble or consciously involved in evil practices. I imagine some could be cursed by someone else. Exactly, because... Any child under the age of reason cannot invite evil on themselves, either directly or indirectly, because right. God would protect and safeguard them. So for a child to really be afflicted with evil, someone else would have to be the cause of that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they've been cursed, uh, dedicated to a demon. You know, one of the exorcisms in Rome that I was able to participate in, the young lady told me that her mother had dedicated her to Satan at her birth. And by the time she was 12, she was able to escape from that environment. She ended up on the streets of Rome and then eventually made her way to the priest who was mentoring me. Wow. And then he was able to get her out of that and break the forces of evil in her life. The great news is that she went on to become a religious sister. <laughs> and she dedicated her life to working with street children in the city of Rome. She knew what it was like to be on the streets. And so she was striving to make a positive difference in the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And what's important about that story is that it reminds us that no matter, you know, how one may be involved in evil, no one's ever completely lost to God. God can reach anybody. Father Lambert, sounds like a good place to end this. Thank you for being here and for your work. Well, just want to thank you for viewing, and please feel free to share with your family and friends. And hopefully you can uh, share this and... Educate some of your friends and family that, that don't know anything about exorcisms and devil possession. Thank you.